Well, thank you, and uh, welcome, everybody. Um, Fifty years on, has the church still got its head in the sand? That was uh, the title for this evening's lecture. Um, my answer, I'll tell you what my answer is going to be at the beginning. Um, it's going to be that its head came out for a few years at the time of Honest to God, then went back in again, and now, 50 years later, is showing signs of peering out again. But there's all to play for. Honest to God marked the end of an era. I shall begin by describing the era that was ending so as to clarify what Honest to God was reacting against. The era I'm speaking of began in the 19th century. Church history books praise the 19th century religious revivals. Apparently, they were the high point from which we have declined. The reason is the number of people who attended church services. This was when voluntary church going reached its peak. In fact, the main reason for all that church going was a negative one. The fear of atheism. It seemed at the time that science had disproved, or soon would disprove, the existence of God and life after death. We are nothing but atoms pushing each other in accordance with eternal laws of nature. Nothing has purpose or meaning. All morality, value and meaning are errors of the human mind. Today, we handle these issues differently. What happened then was that people flocked to the churches to hear a more acceptable account of reality. The churches responded in different ways. Some believed that Christians have nothing to fear from good science and should be pleased to learn from it. Among them were the founders of Modern Church, the organization I work for, and Petrus just mentioned it. There's some information about it on the stall over there. But we became a minority and got labeled as liberals. A different group, the anti-evolutionists, defied science on the ground that the Bible is a better science textbook than the latest theories. But most churches reaffirmed an older theory that divided reality into two. On the one hand, the physical universe, which could be left to the scientists, and on the other, the spiritual realm where the human soul relates to God. These churches saw it as their job to leave the physical world to the scientists and instead concentrate on spiritual matters beyond the reach of science. It's this version of Christianity that Robinson reacted against. Many people today still think of it as traditional Christianity. 150 years ago, it was new. So, what made that era different? Protestants and Catholics alike changed. In the first half of the 19th century, evangelicals were noted for their campaigns against the slave trade and poor working conditions. But by the end of the century, they were arguing that for a Christian to help a non-Christian live a better life, it would first be necessary to convert them. They emphasized the individual's conversion experience, speculated about an imminent second coming, and spoke in tongues. 
Catholics revived the monastic orders and insisted that the sacraments produce real benefits. They had more visions of angels, saints and Mary than they had had since the Middle Ages. A string of papal encyclicals insisted on accepting some most improbable miracles and legends. Everlasting damnation became popular teaching once more and Protestants and Catholics alike set sail to rescue the heathen from it. In popular culture, more people saw ghosts and the modern spiritualist movement was founded with its clairvoyance and messages from the dead. These were, 150 years ago, innovations. Christianity had not always been like that. You can appreciate the difference if you ask what happens when churches fall out with each other. In the 17th century, they fought wars over how God wants the state to be governed. In the, at the end of the 19th century, they took each other to court over candles on the altar. <laughs> That's a big change, isn't it? And I'm sorry to say that this very church took St. Margaret's Toxteth to court over that issue. <laughs> but it wouldn't, we wouldn't do it now. <laughs> well, suppose you buy into that otherworldly theory. What follows? People understood that scientists gather facts by studying the world. But how do religious leaders know their truths? Protestants and Catholics alike appealed to divine revelation as an absolute, unquestionable authority. The first major Protestant work declaring the Bible infallible was Charles Hodge's Systematic Theology. It was published in 1871 just one year after the First Vatican Council had declared the Pope infallible. By the end of the 19th century, the Vatican had redefined the word dogma to mean what it means today. Something revealed by God, eternally true, and obligatory belief for the faithful. Originally, the word comes from a Greek word meaning, it seems. This meant that for Protestants and Catholics alike, spiritual truth was all in the past. Whereas science kept discovering new things about the physical world, any new ideas about the spiritual world must by definition be false. If you wanted to be an upright, loyal Christian, you would have to believe what you were told. If you didn't, depending on which uh, denomination you belonged to, you might spend eternity being punished in hell. Now, if that was the incentive, it didn't matter whether those beliefs made any sense to you, you just had to assent to them. And today I still hear Christians talking about what we are supposed to believe as though we just have to assent to these dogmas without worrying about whether they're true or even whether we can understand them. One result of this reactionary phase was that by separating religion from the physical world, <coughs> they made Christianity seem irrelevant. Another result was that by insisting that Christian teaching comes from a divine revelation given in the past, they had no way to change their teaching. By the end of the 1950s, 
Christian teaching seemed way out of date. After two world wars and a depression, most people didn't have much use for a religion like that. With honest to God, at last a bishop publicly stood out against it. Compared with today, in 1963, far greater numbers of people went to church and church leaders had much more public influence, especially Church of England bishops. What Robinson said about God, Jesus, ethics, prayer and worship all appealed for a faith which isn't so otherworldly but instead relates to people's real lives. The pressure for change came largely from sexual ethics. For about a century, sexual matters had dominated the moral concerns of the Western churches. Today it's hard to imagine how much they had invested in forbidding sex outside marriage and contraception for married couples. But far away in Puerto Rico and Haiti, some women were undergoing medical trials. And yes, it proved possible to suppress ovulation. In 1961, the pill was introduced into the UK. For married women only, of course. In 1962, 50,000 women were already taking it. 1962 was also the year of the Cuban Missile Crisis, when we came within a whisker of World War III. The churches didn't have as much to say about that. They were concentrating on a devastating moral crisis. Now, get this. In the UK alone, 50,000 women were taking the pill. It would only be a matter of time before it got into the hands of unmarried women. <laughs> moral crisis. Robinson wrote in Honest to God, quote, there is no need to prove that a revolution is required in morals. It has long since broken out. There are plenty of voices within the church greeting it with vociferous dismay. End of quote. Robinson argued, I'll just hold on for a minute. Robinson argued that the way Christianity was being taught, God was a far distant creator and judge. Jesus came down to earth from far away and didn't really belong on earth. Moral rules were laid down as instructions coming from far away and prayer and worship were impositions which people struggled to fulfil. In other words, the whole structure of church teaching made Christianity feel alien to the kinds of people we actually are. Quote, It will doubtless seem to some that I have by implication abandoned the Christian faith and practice altogether. On the contrary, I believe that unless we are prepared for the kind of revolution of which I've spoken, it will come to be abandoned. And that will be because it is moulded in the form we know it by a cast of thought that belongs to a past age. The ethic he offered instead was the love ethic. 
Now here's another quote. Life in Christ Jesus, in the new being, in the spirit, means having no absolutes but his love, <coughs> being totally committed in every other respect, but totally committed in this. Love alone, because as it were it has a built-in moral compass, enabling it to home intuitively upon the deepest need of the other, can allow itself to be directed completely by the situation. It alone can afford to be utterly open to the situation, or rather to the person in the situation, uniquely and for his own sake. Three years later, another best-selling book was published, Joseph Fletcher's Situation Ethics. When Robinson wrote Honest to God, he was already familiar with Fletcher's ideas. So when Honest to God talked about the new morality in 1963, looking back, it seems the changes had only just begun. What Robinson said about ethics was important, but what he said about God was more so. So I want to say a bit now about what he had to say about God. Um, this is what he was most famous for. The overall point was that churches were still describing God using outdated concepts. The Bible speaks of a three-level universe with the heavens above, the earth below, and the waters under the earth. From that perspective, God is above us. Up there, he says. Once people believed that literally. Later, science rejected the three-decker universe and people pictured God as being beyond the universe, out there. This picture was acceptable for a long time, but it is still a picture, an analogy, and now is also often inadequate. Instead, Robinson borrowed from Paul Tillich the description of God as the ground of our being. And I'm really pleased he didn't say, down there. <laughs> Another quote. Though we shall not, of course, be able to do it, I can at least understand what those mean who urge that we should do well to give up using the word God for a generation so impregnated has it become with a way of thinking we may have to discard if the gospel is to signify anything. End quote. He wanted to resist the idea that God was living in some remote part of the universe. However, he didn't want to deny it either. His point was that our language about God should reflect the way we relate to God. And this is about ultimate significance, what matters most, not about someone far away. Now, as a problem, in the circumstances, it was easy for opponents to treat Robinson as part of a rather different movement, the God is dead movement. It was probably this more than anything else that provoked the evangelical reaction against his views. Even today, many conservative evangelicals still treat liberal Christians as just one step away from atheism. I think this is an important part of the story, so I'm just going to step back to describe the issues behind that. The arguments against the existence of God and life after death never were scientific arguments. They were philosophical arguments. 
But hey, how many of us think about our philosophy? You know, we usually don't. The philosophy in question has a name, it's called positivism, which teaches that everything that exists can be observed by humans. Anything we can't observe does not exist or at best is completely irrelevant. Science has, no, has produced no evidence for God, life after death, moral truths or values. So, none of these things exist. This is positivism. It was most popular in the 19th century, but by the end of the century it was losing its appeal. The exclusive focus on empirical evidence, what you can see and hear, didn't work. To give you an example, do you, can you see this lectern? You can all see this lectern. Oh, no, you can't. You can see a brown shape. To call it a lectern is to go beyond the empirical evidence. Right. That's where 19th century positivism had got to by the end, by the time of Ernst Mach. We find ourselves basically knowing practically nothing. Now, in the 1920s, a new version arose, which is called logical positivism. According to this theory, all meaningful statements can be verified in one of two ways, by the evidence of the senses or by logical deduction. Any statement that cannot be verified in either of these ways is meaningless. So, not only does God not exist, but the very idea of God is meaningless. This is atheism at its most extreme. For a while, philosophers took this theory seriously. The trouble was, it also made rather a lot of other things meaningless, as well as God. For example, can you all remember what you had for breakfast? Yes. But you can't verify it, can you? <laughs> <laughs> The same applies to all statements about the past, the axioms of science and mathematics, your mind, other minds, and causation. Positivists had hoped to show that true knowledge comes from science and only from science, but by the middle of the 20th century it had become clear that science does not operate in the way they described. Scientists produce loads of hypotheses about unobservables, Dark matter, black holes, all sorts, you know, I mean, <coughs> lots. But at a popular level, this is where it gets complicated, at a popular level, logical positivism was at its most influential in the 1950s and 1960s. This was the heyday of atheism. Along came God is dead theology. This movement had already begun by 1963 and reached its peak a few years later. Many clergy found they could no longer believe in God. Among them was the chap who taught me doctrine at Theological College. He's passed away now. So he knows now. <laughs> So it's a legit illegitimate question to ask. Was Robinson influenced by the God is Dead movement? Honest to God does not discuss logical positivism or death of God theology. As I understand Robinson, I think he would have criticised it in exactly the same way as he criticised traditional dogmas. By accusing it of treating God as a being out there. He would then have agreed with atheists for rejecting such a god. Robinson knew there was a long tradition of theologians saying, God is greater than we can understand, so all language about God is inadequate, and as society changes, our language about God changes. 
the way I read Honest to God, he was trying to do exactly what the original founders of modern church had set out to do at the end of the 19th century. In both cases, they were responding to a polarization between two extremes. On the one hand, atheists claimed to speak in the name of science and presented reality as determined, pointless and meaningless, but at least you could have sex and you wouldn't be punished in hell after you died. On the other hand, religious leaders offered a rich world full of meaning, purpose and value, but if you bought into that, you had to believe what you were told and probably suppress your sexual libido or else. Neither alternative was comfortable. There were always people asking, is there a third way? Robinson said, yes, there is, and said it authoritatively as a bishop. So, like the founders of modern church, he took the third way to be an open, undogmatic Christianity which was nothing to do with atheism, but could develop its understanding of God and our human calling in the light of new scientific and moral insights. Now, there's a problem with this. Other texts invite a different interpretation. Robinson's critics said he was getting rid of God altogether by redefining the word God to mean something different. So, here's another quote to illustrate this point. To say that God is personal is to say that reality at its very deepest level is personal. That personality is of ultimate significance in the constitution of the universe that in personal relationships we touch the final meaning of existence as nowhere else. To believe in God as love means to believe that in pure personal relationship we encounter not merely what we ought to be, not merely what ought to be, but what is the deepest, veriest truth about the structure of reality. This, in face of all the evidence, is a tremendous act of faith. But it is not the feat of persuading oneself of the existence of a super being beyond the world endowed with personal qualities. Belief in God is the trust, the well-nigh incredible trust, that to give ourselves to the uttermost in love is not to be confounded but to be accepted, that love is the ground of our being to which ultimately we come home. End of quote. In the post-Don Cupid age, a text like this sounds as if Robinson is being non-realist about God. In the realist-non-realist debate, you can ask whether God is a construct of the human mind or whether God would exist anyway even if no minds believed in God. You can also ask, does the word God refer to something naturalistic like nature or the universe or is there more to God like a mind, a personality? I don't see honest to God as attempting to answer these questions. They became popular later on. I think he was presupposing some kind of entity, being, with both independent existence and personality, but was struggling to describe God in a way consistent with the science of his day. That's what I see him doing. I therefore think that subsequent evangelicals were wrong to link him with 1960s atheism. It just happened that those two movements took place at the same time. A, a few more things about the book. 
Honest to God also shocked people with what Robinson said about prayer, worship and Jesus. On personal prayer and church services, he made the same basic point, that God is depicted as a distant being a long way away, so the activities of praying and worshipping become quite separate and different from all our other activities. Instead, he said, they should be rooted in ordinary day-to-day -day life because that is where we meet God. Here's a quote about the communion service. It is, the assertion of the beyond in the midst of our life, the holy in the common. The holy communion is the point at which the common, the communal, becomes the carrier of the unconditional as the Christ makes himself known in the breaking and sharing of bread. Unquote. It's the same basic theme. <coughs> we need to get away from a religion which is all about the distant and otherworldly and root our faith in the physical world and ordinary life. The chapter on Jesus calls him the man for others. If any chapter seems out of date, it's this one, because he could not have foreseen the immense progress in Jesus' studies since his time. Nevertheless, his argument was moving in the right direction. If you read the four Gospels carefully, you can find lots of conflicting statements about Jesus. It was not till the 19th century that scholars examined the issues carefully and created biographies of Jesus. At this time, theological scholarship was led by Germans. And in the first half of the 20th century, these Germans had a problem. They really, really didn't want to know that Jesus was a Jew. So, the fashion at the time was to say that we can't really know anything about the Jesus of history, but never mind what matters is the Christ of faith. Robinson could see that if you take the Jesus of history out of that, it won't do. When the New Testament authors described Jesus as Christ and gave Christ titles, everybody knew that they were referring to that man, Jesus. That was the whole point of talking about Christ. Otherwise, what is Christ? Just a second God. Although he could not have foreseen later scholarship about Jesus, he could see that a modern faith with Jesus at the centre must conceive of Jesus not as a vague second God, but as a real person focused on the big issues of his day and engaging with them in ways that were appropriate to his own day and age. Well, Honest to God sold over a million copies. Then what happened? During the 1960s, the churches in this country did move in the direction Robinson was arguing for. The bishops in the House of Lords made major liberalising contributions to legislation, for example, to decriminalise homosexuality and abolish capital punishment. They were ahead of public opinion. But since the 1970s, there has been a reaction against it. Most churches have reverted to the dogmatic positions of the past. Recently, the issues on which religious leaders have come together to put effective pressure on the British government have been matters of individual behaviour, and in each case they have resisted change. On assisted dying, 
on equal opportunities for gays and lesbians and on equal opportunities for women. In the Church of England, the liveliest debates in the last few years have been about women's ministry and same-sex partnerships. Non-issues for most churchgoers, let alone the rest of the population. This time last year, the Church of England's General Synod had its big vote on women bishops. And an alliance of conservative evangelicals and Catholics got just enough votes to prevent the introduction of women bishops. Those opponents were not addressing the spirituality of the nation. They were battening down the hatches, trying to preserve their church clubs from any influence by the world outside. If you read the Church Times, uh, week after week, there are articles and letters making this point. We mustn't give in to the world outside, they're saying. That's what that argument is about. In other words, most churches today are still operating in that manner that was first developed in the 19th century reactions against atheism. The 1960s now look like a brief interlude when Christians could think outside the box. But society as a whole did not go back to the situation bef before the 1960s. What Robinson feared has come about. Most people have decided that dogmatic Christianity of the churches was not for them. They also rejected the empty universe of the positivists. There began a variety of spiritual movements, and there are so many, now, you know, the New Age movement, Western influence in Buddhism, Indian guru, um, uh, there are so many now. Most people in this country, according to the surveys, now describe themselves as somehow spiritual, but emphatically not religious. What this usually means is that they're not atheists, they believe there is a spiritual dimension to reality, but as soon as you ask them to define what they mean by it, whoa, hold on, ooh, if we try to define it, we're in danger of ending up with religion, with dogma. We don't want that, definitely. The package has unravelled. The dogmas which in the 19th century reassured people that there is a spiritual dimension to reality are now the very things that put people off any informed reflection about any spiritual reality they do believe in. So what about the present? I think there are signs that the dogmatic era is finally coming to an end and that the door opened by honest to God is opening once again. Increasingly, church leaders know they cannot carry on indefinitely just being reactionaries. They know there is a yearning for spiritual guidance and that the most people are looking elsewhere because they don't want dogmas. It will be interesting to see what impact the no new Pope has. It's quite clear already that a lot of people are hopeful and not just Roman Catholics. Uh, I'm a priest in the Church of England and as far as the Church of England is concerned, I suspect that last year may in the end prove to have been a turning point. Three times church leaders formally adopted a position on a public issue which the overwhelming majority of churchgoers, let alone the rest of the population, strongly disagreed with. The first was on the Anglican Covenant, which was really about gay bishops. The second was on women bishops. And the third was on gay marriage. What really drove home just how out of touch they were 
was last November's vote in General Synod on women bishops. Right up to the day of the vote, they were agonising over how to accommodate the opponents. They weren't thinking about all the Christians who don't go to church because their local church is so reactionary or who really don't want to associate with a church that still discriminates against women. Those had kind of fallen off the radar. They didn't foresee the strength of public reaction when the motion was defeated. Now they know. Well, I've described Honest to God as an opening up after a dogmatic era in the history of Christianity. In the churches, the opening up didn't last. The dogmatism re-established itself, but there are now signs that it is at last coming to an end. In that era, Christian practice was about attending church services. Christian ethics was about sexual repression. Christian philosophy was about the otherworldly. Christian spirituality was about the non-physical. If that era is coming to an end, what I hope for is a return to a more holistic Christianity, a Christianity integrated into the whole of life. Christian philosophy will still include the otherworldly, the divine and life after death, but it will relate them much more closely to the worldly and life before death. First we value and reflect on what we've got now, and only then is it appropriate to reflect on what else there may be. Christian spirituality will include the non-physical, but will no longer separate it from the physical as though the two were opposites. Because we are physical beings, a realistic spirituality begins with the physical. It is through the physical that we come to appreciate the non-physical. Christian practice will still include church services, but they will no longer be the supreme yardstick for measuring Christian influence. Instead, Christian influence will be expressed in a wide range of activities, expressing whatever Christians think life is about, all the way from donating a tin of beans to the food bank to taking part in government. Christian ethics will still include a concern for sexuality, but its concern will be more constructive and just one issue among many. In the grand scheme of things, public ethical discourse does not need to spend much time on, whether, on what gays do in private. It does need to address climate change, the bedroom tax and military engagement in Syria. Honest to God argued that Christianity should not be seen as an alien system imposed on us contrary to our nature by a distant God. Instead, it should express and be expressed by ordinary life as we know it. The change Robinson hoped for began, flourished for a while, and was then suppressed, at least in the churches. There are signs that it is reappearing again now. I hope it is. But it will take more than one courageous bishop to make it happen. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, we now have about 25-30 minutes for questions, which Sarah Doyle, our curate, is going to leave in discussion time. Okay, just to say we are going to finish about half past, um, sort of promptly, so. Thanks. thanks, Petra, and thanks, Jonathan. So, do we have any questions for Jonathan at all? Any thoughts, comments? Yeah. 
Um, can I just say that um, the last um, thing I read that the Pope, the new Pope, has said that as far as the Catholic Church is concerned, it's what you more or less like what you've just said. He wants people to concentrate on what's going on now and love and you know, rather than dogma, which is exactly what you said. And not concentrate on what people are doing wrong rather than concentrate on helping people. And that's what you're doing about. Mm. Thank you. Yes. I, it's very encouraging, isn't it? Yes. yes. And, and, yeah. Uh, I always feel something of an outsider in the Liverpool Party because I'm Scottish and uh, I come from a Scottish Presbyterian background and because I took degrees in philosophy at Edinburgh and Oxford. And, uh, it, when I grew up, apart from the Edinburgh Festival, the most exciting thing happening in the world was the clash between Bart and Boltman. Now, neither of these was Scottish, but the Edinburgh Theological Faculty was Bartian and the Glasgow Theological uh, Faculty was Boltmanite. So that, but I didn't hear Boltman mentioned. Now, isn't Boltman really the, the person, well, effectively Robinson says it, and it was very, very interesting, he began to be interested in German theologians who hadn't concerned him much when he was a student. Well, that's, to me, as it puts, uh, you know, Anglican well, theology in England, shall we say, in a rather strange situation. But he did mention these German theologians. But I may have been, I don't know, perhaps you were being tactful. He didn't sort of bring Bultmann in, and some people would say that Bultmann was an atheist. Would you care to comment on the Bultmann issue? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Alice. Yeah, you're quite right. Yeah. Um, I, honest to God, has lots of quotes from three German theologians of the middle of the 20th century, Bultmann being one, the other two are Dietrich Bonhoeffer and Paul Tillich. And um, they influenced his thinking a great deal. Now, I, I didn't talk about them because uh, I just felt we want to look at how it how honest to God plays out now. That's certainly they influence his thinking and it indicates just how important German thinking was at the time. Um, Bultmann, of course, was um, known for his attempts to, his proposals to demythologize uh, the Bible. Um, my feeling about that is that biblical scholars have I've done so much more detailed work on pulling apart all the biblical text and working out, you know, what do we mean by myth and what do we mean by demythologizing, that um, today I think one wouldn't start by reading Bultmann. That, that's my take. You probably disagree with that. <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of ordinary people who like connection with, with Christianity is through church services, right? Parish churches, so that not reading theologians and so on. Do you see any progress in the type of service being offered on a Sunday in worship? I'm conscious of the progressive Christianity movement and the developing creeds and so on. And over the country, do you see development so that the liturgies that are on offer relate a bit more to everyday, normal experience? Um, uh, could you hear the question? Yes. Yeah, okay, yeah. Um, relating the church services to that, this is something actually I quite. I, f I feel is very important. The words actually used in church services, people learn the, people learn the words of hymns best, actually, um, but also the words of prayers that are used repeatedly over and over again. Um, and every denomination deals with it differently. The Roman Catholic system is, when they brought out the English Missal, you know, established, spent years 
getting their theologians to work out exactly what's to be said, write it in Latin, and then everybody translates it into a different language, and that's, that's what you use. Um, the Church of England is a bit like that, but actually most clergy don't pay any attention to what the rules are, they break them. But most churches in the Church of England do actually use common worship, which came out in the year 2000, and uh, to my mind, completely missed the boat because by by 2000, people were more and more just well, the clergy were changing things and um, inventing their own. So, on. what we really needed was was a set of resources and and perhaps rules to how to use the resources, but not an order of service as such. Um, so, and of course, other denominations are much freer to do what they want. Um, but whether they, what they do is, varies. St. Bride's is a bit unusual in Liverpool in that we do have a, a wide range of different um, liturgies, li different kinds of wording used. Um, so, I come at the question as an Anglican priest who doesn't like common worship. There are lots of bits of words that I think say things that I would really rather replace them. <laughs> um, uh, you mentioned the creeds. Um, my own view is that we shouldn't ask people to recite a creed in a church service because you're standing up there and saying, I believe X, Y, Z. Well, actually, I think, you know, if we're going to have public church services, it should be open to people to come who don't believe or who not sure what they believe, or just want to come and take part and not put them on the spot and say, now we stand and tell everybody what we believe. So I would prefer not to have a creed in the church services. I think it's going back on that. I've thought, when we say the creeds, how many different creeds are being said? It's how many people have we got, not the fathers? And do people fully understand, sort of, I rather wonder that, sort of, if we actually said to people, what does that mean? Yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah. Um, uh, if you want to know what the standard Nicene Creed that's used in communion service, what it means, it's it's not as happy as it might be that you know the Eastern and Western Church fell out over the meaning of the Greek word for of the same substance, with Jesus being of of the same substance with the Father. There's never really any agreement about that. Um, you may know that. Um, a thousand years ago, the Eastern Church and the Western Church fell out over whether the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father or whether the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son, and it all got caught up in international politics. And obviously today, when people recite the Creed, uh, you'd have a job finding anybody who cares. <laughs> uh, so it's a bit silly to ask people to recite these things. Uh, another thing that um, I hope doesn't put you off too much going to church. Um, right at the end, um, I believe in the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Well, the original Greek means the standing up again of the corpses. They still, when they fixed those words, they still believed that the graves were going to open and the bodies were going to come up. Just a, just a general back and then just, uh, just yeah. Um, sorry I was late, by the way. But, um, <laughs> I'm ancient enough to remember when Honest to God came out. And it was a very, well, not very, but a, a conservative Anglo Catholic college. And the initial reaction amongst the staff, I suppose, and maybe many of the students at the moment, was almost horror. That this was a, a radical, uh, destructive um, onslaught against the Christian faith. <coughs> and it very soon became clear that that wasn't the case. And it was paralleled by Michael Ramsey, the Archbishop of Canterbury at the time, who, when Mr. God came out, I think he didn't he write a pamphlet or something yeah. denouncing it. And then only a few months or a year later, apologized for it and said, no, there was a lot of truth and a lot of sense and a lot of wisdom 
in what Robinson had said. And I think it's as people reflected on the, the roots of the tradition, that actually the, the tradition, the faith that's been handed on to us, is not the sort of mechanical, um, box-ticking, rule-following sort of religion that you described he was reacting against. But which is a very real thing. It wasn't the tradition. It was a, a misrepresentation of the tradition. Um, I mean, for example, Thomas Merton, the, the American uh, monk and writer, owed his conversion to the fact that he had been reading medieval theology. And the medieval theology said very clearly, God is not a being. God is being. God is being itself. And that, that really found insight uh, is at the heart of the tradition. And all of our attempts to sort of put it, you know, frame it and, and label it and stick, stick it into categories is, is missing the point. And I wonder if Robinson may be slightly misunderstood because he gives the impression through the book of saying, no, I don't want to follow the tradition because the tradition is wrong, the tradition is all legalistic or whatever. And I'm not sure they really understood what the tradition really was, but I may be wrong on that. Any of that point? Oh. Thank you, Dave. There's, there's, there's so much there, I, I don't know where to start. Um, but on your last point, uh, um, oh, thank you. I think, I, I think what I said about the definition of the word dogma kind of summarizes, I think, the main response I'd want to make, which is that what he was reacting against was actually only invented in the second half of the 19th century. This, you know, you have to believe exactly what you're told stuff. Um, and obviously there always were people who thought like that. But as you say, the uh, earlier tradition is much more diverse. Much more diverse. But when you at your theological college heard your colleagues saying, oh, this is dreadful, they were thinking in terms of how it criticised the Christianity they had been brought up with. Um, and I hear a lot of... I blog, I'm afraid. I, it's the Bodden Church site, and I respond sometimes to conservative evangelicals and Catholics, and they respond to me. And very often, I get the impression that when people call themselves conservatives, what they mean is they agree with the version of Christianity that they grew up with. Yeah. And if you think Christianity is 2,000 years old almost, actually that's just a tiny, tiny proportion of it. Um, so, yeah, Robinson was saying he was reacting against a tradition and he was, he meant a particular tradition that was comparatively new in terms of the whole history of Christianity. I think a lot of the problems he had issues with, um, uh, you know, you could quote Thomas Aquinas in support of the, the you know, Thomas Aquinas was a theologian in the 13th century. Um, and um, yeah, so, right. Uh, just a, a comment, really. Uh, I was at a college where uh, John Robinson had been the dean, and after he left, we still used his uh, order of worship on a Sunday. And it might interest you to know that it was a Book of Common Prayer communion service. But the way it was explained and presented, it was something which involved the whole community and was about making the ordinary special, or seeing the specialness of the ordinary. And I think if we want to understand John Robinson, we must see him as a fairly conservative biblical scholar interested in the man Jesus Christ, and uh, as an evangelist. And what shattered him was going to South London and finding empty churches 
and that the Christian message was just not ringing bells with people because the church had lost contact with ordinary people and ordinary life. And that was why he wrote Honest to God. Thank you. Thank you. The one thing I remember from reading Honest to God some years ago is when he talks about personal prayer, and you can mm -hmm. say much about that. I wonder if you could, because the one thing I remember, and I may be remembering this wrong, he talks about his sense of relief, of freedom when he stops having to pray. I presume by that he meant saying the, the, the office. Yeah. Um, but he, he definitely talked about a sense of release. Um, but I wasn't quite sure in what context. I don't remember what else he said about that. I just wondered if you could clarify that. Right. Well, what struck me about what he says about prayer is he describes what happened at his theological college when he was training and they were all told how to do their prayers and what to say and you know all the everything they had to do and he found that spiritually it didn't work for him and with a bit of prodding he found that all the other students actually felt the same, but nobody wanted to admit it. <laughs> or at least nobody wanted to be the first to admit it. And it kind of came from there um, that um, the rules were, again, rules imposed. You know, this is how you do it. And if it doesn't work for you, there's something wrong with you. Um, and... And so you experience it as an additional obligation, not something that helps you with your life, but an extra thing you have to do. And uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I, can I can relate that to my own religious upbringing with the feeling that there's lots of things, that being a Christian means there's lots of extra things you have to do, which you do them. And, you're not, yeah, doesn't necessarily that help. Obtain, do you think that still obtains today? I think that's still the perception people have as this is how you pray and you're not a proper Christian if you don't do it like this, in whatever way that is. I think if you went round all the churches in Liverpool today to see what, how prayer is being taught, I think you'd have a, quite a mixture, would you? But you probably know this better than I do. Um, I would guess that an awful lot I would guess that most either don't say much at all about how to pray or if they do they're still laying it on the line exactly what you should do is, um, would I be right about that? My experience is from going around a number of different churches is that very little is said about private prayer mm -hmm. apart from you have a quiet time or just right. the unspoken assumption if you're from an evangelical background which is um, and it's more about you engaging scripture. That's right, it. Yeah. And prayer is much more a shopping list. Oh. Of what God already knows. <laughs> right. God, you know, it's like this is all terrible. Do something. Yeah. That kind of prayer. Yeah. Um, and it, there's very little that is actually about really engaging with you and thou. Yes. The one who mm. is mm. and who does not force us. Mm. Mm. Well, again, um, uh, one can find that kind of thing in the history of Christianity. I mean, just think of the monastic movement, you know, all sorts of different forms of meditation and contemplation developed. Um, but, yeah. Um, I think he also mentioned something that's a particular problem I have with, with um, prayer. You know, in, in most church services there's a time of intercession. You pray for the world, for other people. And, and the problem we keep, or the, the problem I keep having is how are we relating to God now? Because I don't like to put myself in the position that I know what's best and I'm telling God what to do. It's actually the other way round. 
God has let go of the power and has given us freedom to do the right thing or the wrong thing and so the prayer should be about us listening so that we can take on board so that we can perceive what we ought to do rather than telling God to do it Oh, oh, yeah, lots of hands Thank you. Thank you. That, that's very helpful. Um, the Quaker tradition, of course, has, has this tradition of emphasizing the inner light. That within every one of us, there is that of God that is there to be opened up. So that's, that's particularly powerful in the Quaker tradition. Um, but um, uh, as you say, um, it's there in the Roman Catholic tradition, it's there in a lot of traditions. I fear over the last generation or so, at least in this country, um, and I suspect in, in America as well, um, we've been um, swamped by the cult of being busy. Um, so we don't stop and reflect and give time for the quality we've got to have a long shopping list. And, and I mean, I, if there are any clergy in the Diocese of Liverpool here, you will be receiving from the diocese lots of lists of people to pray for. Um, and if you pray for them all, you, you're going to spend a lot of time doing just that. <laughs> um, just a lazy Well, that's, that's wonderful. But you're talking about your father doing this 50 years ago. Well, I was brought up on Honest to God and lived from this. Yeah. Yeah. So that's brilliant. Yeah. Thank you. Um, just, I think you, you had your hand up before. Yeah. Right? And then, so. I did really. It was, it was really a reflection again on prayer. So perhaps we're going back to where we were a moment ago. Um, I seem to remember that <clears throat> shortly after the Honest to God thing, one of the things I remember being quite, uh, quite popular was some, a little book by Mikel Koist called Prayers of Love. Oh yes! Remember that? Excellent book. And, and, and one of the, the headings, chapter headings, was All of Life Becomes a Prayer. Um, and there were things that basically it was a reflection uh, or a series of reflections on what he saw and experienced. And it, it wasn't anything about telling God. It was a, very much about this business of listening and feeling and experiencing and, and reflecting on that experience. Um, now, that, that seemed to happen for a while. And I don't know what's followed it in that sense, but it was very popular at that time. Mm, I remember. I used it. Yeah. yeah. Mm, that's so good. Yeah. yeah. And then probably just two more questions. So... You say it and then yourself. Just a, a comment on uh, John Robinson's prayer life. Every night of his married life, he and his wife would say a traditional collect, uh, asking that 
we may so pass through things temporal that we finally lose not the things eternal. <laughs> Thank you. There we are. That's the right order. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I, I believe the book has gave permission for people to think outside of the box. And people need this permission to do these things. When you've inherited a faith mm. and you get trapped and blinkered and narrow-minded, it is hard to make that first step out. And when you read a book like that or hear about a book like that, it's sort of giving you the permission to have a go, mm. to be extemporary. Now, I'm a Methodist minister and I have the privilege of being extemporary in everything, which is fantastic. And so, you know, this, this permission, but there's some people still in our churches that still cannot think outside the box in case it takes away the whole of their faith. It's frightening still, yeah. even years yeah. later. Yeah, yeah. Well put. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, the, it is still an ongoing debate. Um, and as I understand it, um, I wrote a bit about this in one of the books, there, Liberal Faith in a Divided Church. If you look at what happened at the Reformation, to begin with, there was no Protestant church, no equivalent to the Roman Catholic Church and the Roman Catholic, uh, the Vatican claimed that God had given the Pope authority to interpret the Bible. The Bible was the authority for Christians but the Pope had authority to interpret it and the Protestants said no the Pope doesn't have authority to interpret it and the problem then is well how do you interpret it and initially um, uh, the, the early Protestant reaction was well you don't interpret it you accept it as it is literally the clear plain teaching of the Bible and if you've heard that term the clear plain teaching that's where it comes from um, and the assumption is that you look at the answers in the Bible and everybody has the same Bible so the answers should be clear. So therefore, if any two Christians disagree with each other, one of them is wrong, completely wrong. They're not reading the Bible, right? That, 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 do you follow the logic of that? And that is what is still happening today. I was um, very involved in um, trying to present the case against the proposed Anglican Covenant, which was about gay bishops. You remember there was a, a, a gay man was appointed bishop in America, and um, American bishops who were opposed got together with them. Um, th they wanted to to have this stopped for this reason that you know there is a text in the Bible that forbids it, and therefore we can't have any church leaders doing that sort of thing, and they. Uh, they needed support from African bishops because there are a lot more African bishops and uh, so we had 10 years of internal dispute in the Anglican Communion and it's very much about this. We've just had the um, second GAFCON conference, just, was it last week or the week before? Um, the first one was deliberately timed to coincide with the 2008 Lambeth conference so as to snub the Archbishop of Canterbury. No, we're not coming to your conference, we're going to have our own. Precisely for the reason you describe. So it's still around and it still matters that, you know, once you... Uh, th there's this whole difference of view about authority and if you let people actually think for themselves, the whole thing becomes much more creative. Yeah. Thank you, thanks Jonathan. Thank you Jonathan. Um, just reminded me when you were talking, there's something, um, I was just sort of thinking about Robin, Bishop Robinson as somebody who had the courage to speak out and seek change and felt passionately about the change that is needed. And he as many other people you know, not only in the church, but across the society, there are always some people who see how oppressive it is when change is not possible. 
I come from a background, you know, and was growing up in a society that which sort of experienced that kind of oppression. And we are at St. Bride's involved in so many different activities and supporting uh, actions where, which are seeking positive change. And there are those people, you know, and people among us who believe that sort of being honest and speaking and seeking change can make a difference, even though we are here 50 years on from when the book was published and thinking what has happened. And as you said, Jonathan, things did happen and there were reactions to it. But things that are moving on, even though sometimes we can be, feel quite um, pessimistic about the possibilities, and there always seems to be so much more to do. But the fact that people are speaking for change, the fact that people are thinking, as you've said, just the fact that people are allowed to think and see change possible, that's what actually makes a big difference. I remember, I think it was a Brueggemann in one of his um, Old Testament commentaries talking that, it, that it's about that kind of knowledge of a possibility of a difference that already makes the difference a reality. And I think that's from what you've been talking about, Bishop Robinson spoken to me that actually his work was just so essential on it that it allows people to see that there is a different way of seeing church, introducing church to people that, come, that are outside and sort of living our faith in the world around those lives. So thank you, Jonathan, really very much for guiding us through the book and uh, inspiring us again to believe in what that book has already sort of spoken about. And, um, just a few more practicalists towards the end. There is a sheet you can sign up uh, with your name and email address if you are interested to receive information about our next uh, lectures. The one in the spring should be um, Stephen Shakespeare, who is at the philosophy department of Hope University, is going to speak on animal rights. Do you know whether there is any? more concrete um, uh, I'm afraid theme. not. No. Uh, no, I don't know any more. Yeah. But sort of knowing Stephen, it would be very interesting. So um, if you want us to keep you informed, please uh, leave us your details and I will we'll send you an email and we know more. Um, uh, is there any other? Any other? There is still, if you haven't seen any of the information and the booklets, and books on the bookstore, please do uh, grab one uh, before you leave. But thank you very much for coming, and thank you very much, Jonathan, again, for speaking to us.